the case uh, this week. How many of you ladies love a, a good girl's trip? How many of you, like, that's, you're all about that? Yes. Good. I think that my wife has had a chance to go on a few with friends at our previous church and in our time here, even a few weeks ago, she got to go up to the mountains with a couple of ladies from here and they uh, were able to play cards and to, um, not, not gambling, but like at the table. <laughs> Uh, so I like, need to correct that. I, I don't know what all they did, and that's sort of part of it. It's like, you know, what, what happens there stays there kind of thing. But, but they had a great time and able to enjoy that time. And, and I know a lot of you, like, if you've had that opportunity, and I would encourage men to encourage your wives to, to do that. It's a blessing. Well, two years ago, there was, there was a group of ladies in Dayton, Ohio, that decided they wanted to have a girl's trip down to Fort Myers, Florida. And uh, that one of them was turning 40 years old. They thought, wouldn't that be cool to get on a plane, go away, spend that time, celebrate together? The problem was that there was an approaching hurricane, Hurricane Ian. But they decided, these ladies watched the news reports and they decided like a lot of us do, like, like these things feel overstated. It's kind of like when they start talking about snow here in Chattanooga. It feels like they're just wanting us to, sort of baiting us in when there's no snow really going to come. Like, so these ladies are like, there, this is, there's nothing really going to happen. They're sort of overstated. It's not a big deal. Well, let's just get on the plane and go. So they did. They got there. They found a local tiki bar and they began to enjoy some drinks together. They went back to their hotel room. They did a, 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 a photo shoot in their swimming suits. They were being silly and fun and having a great time. And then that night, night, everything shifted because in a matter of moments, they suddenly found that Hurricane Ian, a, a category four hurricane struck that area. And they were on the second floor of this hotel. And before you knew it, these ladies found themselves pinned between the mattresses in their room and the ceiling of the room. Some of them, there was a, a, a hole got torn in the roof somehow, maybe by God's grace that some of them were able to escape, but some of them some of them did not. Some of them actually were died in this celebration. They were partying in the face of a coming storm and they faced the painful consequences. That to me is a is metaphorically speaks of and I think helps us get a sense of what's happening here in Hosea as we're entering into chapter 9 today. We, we've been seeing, and by the way, Hosea is not like a singular, Hosea didn't sit down, we don't believe as I understand it, Hosea didn't sit down in a singular moment led by the Holy Spirit, penned 14 chapters, went out and read it to the people and was done. These are a collection of oracles that were shared, that were declared over time and in the course of various events and activities. Well, chapters 8 and 9 were a declaration of explanations for and warnings related to this coming destruction and captivity that would be brought about through the Assyrians. And we have the benefit because of history to look back and realize that's exactly what happened, that by 722 BC, the Assyrian army sweeps in and many of the people were killed and many others were carried away into exile to become slaves to the Assyrian empire. We know that what God warned about did in fact come to pass just as he said that it would. But God was warning his people through Hosea and they were busy partying. This is likely, it's believed that the context here is that this would have been some festival season. The, the harvest has come in. There is celebration that is occurring. It's a festival. It's dancing. It's, it's, a, it's a big time. It's a lot of fun and abundance of food. It's time to party. And then above the noise of the festival, all of a sudden Hosea is led by God and he's calling for the people to pay attention to what really matters. You guys are getting all wound up and excited about these crops and these crops are temporary and they won't last. And oh, by the way, on the horizon, there is a gathering storm. On the horizon, there is a gathering judgment that is coming. And so, and so instead of partying, we should be, we should be praying. Instead of, and instead of feasting in this way, we should be crying out to God and repenting and in brokenness. That much like the days of Noah, when Noah, when, when, when we're told that the people were drinking and eating right up until the time until the flood came in and suddenly the judgment of God poured out and many lives were taken. That in the same, it's, there's something about our human fallibility that ignores these gathering storms. But God was graciously warning and calling and inviting his people to, to pay attention to and to invest their lives in what matters most. In fact, if I could summarize sort of the big idea for chapter nine today, it's this, pay attention to the things that matter most. 
in your life, in your heart, in our culture, in our church, in our world. Don't close your ears or your eyes or your heart to what God is saying, how God is leading, what God is revealing, how God is moving. Pay attention to what matters most. To do that, there are three principles that we can embrace based on what we see here. Three, Three of them. Number one, don't celebrate the wrong things. Don't celebrate the wrong things. We, we've previously seen that Israel goes through a, a moment, if you will, after years of challenges and political unrest. The, the northern kingdom of Israel has a brief period of respite where politically things are stable, where, where economically they seem to be doing well, where they're able to push out their borders and actually regain some land. But while, they're, while economically and social, politically they, are, they are, are improved for a season, they, they are continuing to tank morally. They are continuing continuing to move away from God. And in this moment, there is this harvest that comes to an end. They've gathered in the crops. Everybody's excited. The hard work is behind them. The the, the barns are full. It's an exciting time for celebration. And above the noise and above the dancing, in comes Hosea. Verse 1, do not rejoice, O Israel, with exultation like the nations, for you have played the harlot. You've committed spiritual adultery. You've been unfaithful to God, forsaking your God. You have loved harlot's earnings on every threshing floor. You, you've been engaged in the, um, in the pagan worship of Baal. And you have ascribed to Baal that he is the source of your blessings. He is the reason your harvest has come in. He is the reason you have been had children. He is the reason why you're doing so well. You have cheated on God. And therefore, what what Hosea said, stop partying, stop celebrating. There is a gathering storm and you're acting like nothing is wrong. You're acting like everything is good. You're partying and feasting and celebrating when, when we, should be, we should be crying out to God and mourning and repenting and begging God to heal us as a people. God is preparing to pour out judgment upon them because they've been unfaithful. He's going to give them what they think they want in order to ultimately reveal to them what they actually truly need. He's going to remove his hand of blessing for a season. It just, and as if to say, if you believe Baal is the source of these things, I'll tell you what, I'll pull my hands back. I will let you look to Baal and you can experience what life is like when you trust in Baal, when you are grateful to Baal, when you worship Baal, when you live for Baal. And let's see what Baal can do for you. Not because he hates them, but because he knows it is foolish to pursue this false God and he's seeking to draw them back to to himself. And so we find verse two, threshing floor and wine press will not feed them. The new wine will fail them. They will not remain in the Lord's land, but Ephraim, which is another way of sending them for Israel, will return to Egypt and in Assyria, they will eat unclean food. They're gonna be carried away to an unclean place. They're going to become an unclean people, defiled, if you will. They'll be forced to eat the things they normally would would have avoided. Verse four, they will not pour out drink offerings of wine to the Lord. Their sacrifices will not please him. Their bread will be like mourner's bread, like cheap bread that's uh, inappropriate to bring in worship to God. All who eat it will be defiled for their bread will be for themselves alone. It will not enter the house of the Lord. What will you do on the day of the appointed festival, on the day of the feast of the Lord? For behold, they will go because of destruction. Egypt will gather them up. Memphis will bury them. Weeds will take over their treasures of silver. Thorns will be in their tents. The day of punishment have come. The days of retribution have come. Let Israel know. Verse seven, the, the, verses, the, the verbs there are in what's been described as the prophetic perfect tense, which means that, that it, what is being described is so imminent, is so certain that they speak of it as if it has already occurred. Punishment is coming, retribution is coming, and it is so sure we can speak of it as if it has already happened. This season of reckoning, this d- discipline of God is upon them. A force far stronger than any hurricane is about to overtake them. And their festivals and their sacrifices and their feasts that were presumptively toward God, but in fact, they did not know God are gonna come to an abrupt end as the Assyrians are going to sweep in. And so this is not a time for partying. This is not a time for, for, um, for celebrating temporal things that won't last. This is a time for mourning, for repentance, for brokenness, for crying out to God in light of what's on the horizon. But their materialism and their, their spiritual um, uh, superficiality is prompting them to celebrate things that ultimately do not matter and will not last. 
When I consider um, the condition of our nation, and uh, I, I, won't, <laughs> I won't even go deep into what, what we saw on, uh, on the other night at the debate, like, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. From a human standpoint, we're in a mess. And when we look at the um, condition of the leadership of our nation, and then we look around at what's happening in our culture, and we see the sinfulness and the prevailing wickedness that is all around us, and we, we see it's just been the last couple of weeks that, that pastors that have been looked up to and celebrated for years suddenly find themselves having to out, be an outed for sin that they have held on to and tried to cover up and hide for years and years now being brought to the service. In light of those things, it would seem odd, wouldn't it, that believers those who we would assume that would be most sensitive to and broken over sinfulness, that we could find ourselves busy celebrating and partying and rejoicing over things that ultimately don't matter and unmoved and unbroken and absent of repentance and of, of hearts that are broken over what we see around us. But we get busy entertaining ourselves with parties and trips and gatherings and as long as our bank account is doing okay, as long as the stock market is on the rise, as long as we still live in the nice neighborhood or able to move into the bigger house or as long as we can go on the better vacation or as long as we're able to go and buy that new outfit we wanted to wear or to go to that activity that we were invited to, as long as we're engaging in these things, these temporal things, these temporary things that ultimately do not and will not last, we can get so lost in these things that we don't even pay attention to the brokenness all around us. So we're out partying and celebrating with a big goofy grin while the, the culture around us is, is like a dumpster fire. It reminds me of James 5. James, the half-brother of Jesus, a leader and pastor in the early church, writing to the wealthy who enjoyed the nicer things of the world. He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments have become moth-eaten, your gold and your silver have rusted. Their rust will be a witness against you and consume your flesh like fire. It is the last days that you have stored up for your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields that you withheld is crying out and it strikes the ears of the Lord. You have lived luxuriously and you've led a, lived in wanton pleasure. You've fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer. I don't think Hosea was. I don't think James was then. And I'm certainly not today. There are things that are worthy of celebration. There are things that we should give thanks for. There, we can gather tonight and we can enjoy the fireworks and we can eat uh, what sounds like really terribly fattening foods, but we can enjoy doing it as a celebration, not of America, but of our, our heavenly father who has allowed us to enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy where we enjoy them. And it is appropriate to celebrate anniversaries and birthdays and, and those moments where we can look back and see the faithfulness and the goodness and the provision of God in our lives again and again. There are times to celebrate. There are times to rejoice. And some of us aren't really good at that if we're honest. But we must guard our hearts against let it getting lost in materialism and a superficial sort of spirituality that prompts us into this sort of fake joy and satisfaction and fulfillment seeking in these things of the world instead of looking to God, pursuing God, crying out to God, desiring God, wanting God above all else. So the challenge is, that you would not let your or my temporal successes or worldly accomplishments take our eyes off of what matters most. Where are the people of God that are crying out on behalf of our city, on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our church, on behalf of your family, on behalf of your straying children or grandchildren? Where are those who are on their face or on their knees for your spouse who is hurting or whatever? Where are the people who would say, these are the things that matter. God is awakening my heart. God, I cry out to you. That is the invitation to us and the challenge that we not celebrate the wrong things. Number two, if we're going to pay attention to the things that matter most, then number two, we must listen for God to speak. 
Listen for God to speak. The storm is approaching. The danger and the threat are on the horizon. And yet here we find God is still speaking. God is still warning. God is still graciously saying, hey, trouble's coming. Turn to me. Cry out to me. You don't have to keep moving in this direction. Forsake your idols. Turn your heart back to me. He sends voices like Hosea and Amos and Isaiah to declare the truth of God and to call people back to himself. But even as they did so, that God's people, that the people of Israel refused to listen. They rejected the warnings, much like that group of ladies coming from Ohio down to Florida, rejected and saw the warnings as overstated and not that big a deal. It's probably not a problem. And so they went anyway in the same way. These people looked at people like Hosea and said, you're extreme, you're radical, you're crazy. If you don't believe me, look what he says, verse seven. This is how people spoke of him. The prophet is a fool. The inspired man is demented. Why would they say that? Because of the grossness of their iniquity? Because their hostility is so great? Ephraim was a watchman with my God, a prophet, yet the snare of a bird catcher is in all his ways and there is only hostility in the house of his God. They have gone deep in depravity as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. They thought Hosea was stupid. Foolish, extreme, radical, crazy, demented, off his rocker. You're out here making, look, we're here to celebrate, dude. We're out here having a good time and you're making a big deal out of this stuff that we don't see as a big deal at all. You're out here making noise about things that really don't matter. These things are culturally acceptable. This is how we live. This is what we do. So so why are you trying to be a buzzkill? Why are you out here trying to rain on our parade? Why are you out here trying to cause trouble? They couldn't and they wouldn't listen because they were so deep in their wickedness that they were hostile to the message of God. Baal worship was so prevalent for so long that it became normal, like a lot of sins in our culture today. And when things like that become normal, then if you speak against it, then you are considered radical. You're considered crazy. You're considered off your rocker. You're considered as extreme. You're considered as a holy roller. Like if you would believe in the principles of God and actually believe that God would call us to live by those in our culture today. But they live, verse 9, as in the days of Gibeah. Well, if you don't know that reference, it goes back to Judges 19, 20, 21. And that is um, one of the darkest stories in the Bible. You have a Hebrew, a Levite who is traveling with his concubine who stops and stays in Gibeah with a host. And in the night, all the men of the city surround the house and demand that the host send the man out so that they can, can have their sexual ways with him. And because in that culture, the the various things associated with it, he didn't send them out, but instead they end up sending two young ladies out and they are raped and taken advantage of all night. And God sees this, and as a result, God, God crushes, God destroys that city because of its evil. And Hosea says that you may not see it or recognize it as such, but for, for, for them in, in Israel at that time, he says, your wickedness, your perversity, your sinfulness is on par with what was happening back then. And in the same way, I could not ignore it then. I cannot ignore it now. I must address it. They may mock and ridicule Hosea if they want, but God's response is coming. Hosea sees himself. He's a watchman on the wall who sees the approaching enemy, who sees danger on the horizon and is seeking to warn the people. And they're too busy partying and they're ignoring what God is saying. So deep in their sin, so distant from God that when God was speaking, they refused to listen. I wonder how many of us really believe that God still speaks today. Like, do you believe that God has something to say to you and for your life and for your marriage and for your family and for our church and perhaps even for our nation? Do do we believe that God is still speaking? I believe he still speaks today in a number of ways based on what he reveals to us in his word. And his word is the primary and key way and the most obvious way that he does speak. God has spoken and continues to speak through 
through the scriptures, through the Bible, and anyone who's willing to come in, 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 with humility and allow the Spirit of God to open up the truth can have access to God's thoughts, God's heart, God's directives on any number of matters of life. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If I wanna know what God thinks about, how God feels about, what God's heart for is for, then I can find principles to those realities all within his word. God is speaking. The question is, am I listening? God speaks through the Holy Spirit. We saw throughout a year and a half of following the book of Acts, how often God would, the spirit of God would prompt people to, to, that were going in one direction to go in another, prompt them to share the gospel, prompt them to speak a word of challenge, prompt them to address some matter, whatever the case may be. The spirit of God, that same spirit dwells in every believer in the room. And that spirit is able to convict us of sin. That spirit is able to prompt us when to share the gospel. That spirit is willing, able to lead us to share a word of encouragement with someone who needs it. That, that spirit of God is able to open our eyes as we we were seeing earlier to see the people around us for who they are and, and not through our cultural lenses, but through the heart of God as people who matter, people who are valuable, people who are, who, who are, are part of his care and compassion. So we have the word of God. We have the, the prompting of the spirit of God. We have our circumstances. God can use our circumstances to jolt us, to shake us, to awaken us, to direct us, to lead us as he would the uh, Israelites through the approaching Assyrian armies. God speaks through other people. I was telling this morning that it's amazing to me how often the Holy Spirit sounds like Buffy Kinlaw. God speaks. God speaks through friends and God speaks through ministry partners and God speaks through others who love, um, who love him and who speak what they say should align with scripture, but what they're, God speaks through others in our lives. God has spoken. God continues to speak. It's, it's sort of like the sun. The sun is always shining. Even on the cloudiest of days and even at night, by the way, when the earth is turned and we can't see it, the sun is still shining. We just can't always see it. God is always speaking. It's just that we don't always hear it because we're not always listening. The question is, are we going to listen? Or will we be like the people of Hosea's day who refuse to hear the truth and to, to reject the word of God, to reject the warnings of God, and to treat those who would dare to speak the truth of God as radical, extreme, and crazy. See, they struggled to listen to Hosea because what Hosea was saying was so radically different from what the culture was saying. Well, duh, he's speaking the truth from a holy God, and the culture is this fallen, broken, wicked, fleshly world around. Guess what? What God says is always going to collide with what this broken world says. And when they, that collision occurs, which voice are we going to lean into? Which voice are we going to listen to? Which voice are we going to be controlled by? But here's the encouraging thing, I think. That God is still speaking. And I thought about it between services. Sometimes when we would say that God is speaking, like we would hear that as God is speaking as if he's continually warning and chastising and attacking and pointing out faults and pointing out flaws and pointing out failures. No, our father is always speaking. And sometimes what his kids need to hear is, hey, I love you. And I got a plan for your life. This isn't out of control. Sometimes what his kids need to hear is that as crazy and wild as this world feels, that he is still on his throne. He is still sovereign. Sometimes we just need to hear that we matter and that our value and our worth is not rooted in um, the size we are or the condition of our skin or whether or not we have hair or what kind of clothes we're able to wear or what car we drive or what neighborhood we live in. He's speaking all the time. And the challenge is, and what I would encourage us with, and I'll come back to this at the end, is to, to is, are you and I willing to find those opportunities in our lives, create the opportunities in our lives to push out all the other noise and all the other voices that would drown his out and to sit down in a quiet place, open up the word of God and slowly and with humility, read scripture and ask him to speak truth to us, and he will.
And we do it because we're pursuing him. Hebrews eleven six 6 says he rewards those who seek him. Are we seeking him? Are we listening to him? That leads to a third and a final principle that if we're going to um, pay attention to the things that matter most, and this is, this is important to note, that number three, that consequences are certain when we ignore God's voice. Consequences are certain when we ignore God's voice. God has been warning and inviting the people to turn. They refuse to listen. God reveals that there are going to be consequences, and those consequences are fast approaching, that are on the horizon, moving towards Israel, perhaps even as he was speaking, while they're partying and celebrating, the Assyrian army is pressing and moving in. They didn't want to listen. The consequences are going to come. If God is speaking today, and he is, and if we refuse to listen, then there are consequences to that decision because, because what God is saying to us is life-giving, is satisfying, is ultimately fulfilling. He wants us to know and to live out his plan, his purpose, his will, his agenda for our lives. And his will for our lives is good. His plan for us is to bring us to a life that is abundant and joyful and peaceful ultimately. And so when we ignore that voice, when we ignore those principles, when we ignore that leading and lean into the other voices of our culture, uh, of our flesh, when we lean into the other voices, then we are moving in a direction that is harmful, that is dangerous. And God, because he loves us, will pull back his hands of blessing for a moment and say, if that's really what you want, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have it. I'm going to let you experience what you think you want so that you can remember again what you really need, which ultimately God is saying is me, is him. Look at what he says, verse 10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your forefathers as the earliest fruit on the fig tree in its first season. These are delightful things. God says, when you, when you were young and before you were even a nation, when I was caring for you in the wilderness, that, that I loved you and my heart was for you and you depended on me and you trusted me and, and I, I enjoyed you. You were savory and you were, you were a blessing and I, I, I enjoyed you like finding grapes in the desert or like the, the, the sweetness of the first figs off of the vine. But... They came to Baal Peor and devoted themselves to shame. And the word for shame there in the Hebrew is a designation that was used for Baal, for the god Baal, the false god Baal. They became as detestable as that which they loved. They worshipped a disgraceful god and themselves became disgraceful. Psalm 115 says, those who make idols become like them. Listen, listen. You become like what you worship. When you worship the true and the living God, then he will continue to transform you and your heart to make you more and more like himself. And when you worship other things and other idols, then you will become more and more like they are disgraceful, broken, powerless. Verse 11, as for Ephraim, their glory will fly away like a bird. God says, I'm going to withdraw my hand to blessing. And when I do, it'll be no birth, no pregnancy, no conception. They will bring up their children, but I will bereave them until not a man is left. Speaking of the death of the people, the death of some of their kids. Yes, woe to them indeed when I depart from them. When I pull back, Ephraim, as I have seen, is planted in a pleasant meadow. I put you in a, a pleasant place to flourish, but Ephraim will bring out his children for slaughter. Give them, O Lord. What, what will you give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. All their evil is at Gilgal indeed. I came to hate them there because of the wickedness of their deeds. I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. Their leaders are rebels. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They bear no fruit. Even though they bear children, I will slay the precious ones of their womb. That sounds really heavy handy. You're like, God, what are you doing here? Well, remember, Baal is a fertility god. He is symbolized as a, as a bull, but he is a fertility God. He was, he was seen as the God that you cried out to for the blessing of your crops and for the ability of, your, um, uh, of, your, uh, of the wives to, or, and the women to have more and more children. 
And so to, to seek his blessings on their crops and on their wives, the people would go, the pagans did, and then God's people followed suit. They started going to the temples to Baal where they would, uh, they would sleep with the temple prostitutes. They would engage in sexual activity with the priests and the priestesses as an offering to the God. When it was a, a big festival day, a big holy day, the whole community would gather in a, a, a gigantic sort of uh, large-scale uh, experience of sexual wickedness that is inappropriate to talk about today in this setting. Some groups would even bring their children to sacrifice them to Baal in order to pray that he would bless them with more and more children. So God says, if if you want to see what Baal can provide for you, if you want to trust in Baal, if you want to give him credit, then I'll let you have what he has to offer, which is no children, no conception, no fertility. You're going to face hard things. The Assyrians are going to come in. They're going to be taken captive. They're going to kill many of the people, including their young. Verse 17 is a summary. My God will cast them away. Why? Because they have not listened to him. Therefore, there'll be wonders among the nations. They refuse to listen to God, so God is going to reject them for a season, expel them from the land. They're going to face the consequences of their choices. This is not the final word on Israel because we know, according to Romans 11 and other places, that God is going to ultimately restore and to call uh, Jewish people from all 12 tribes to Israel to finish what he started and bring glory to himself. But for a season, and by season, we don't mean like a few days or a few weeks, meaning like generations they face the very real painful results of celebrating when they should have been repenting and failing to listen to God. They have chosen the very sexualized practices of Baal worship that appealed to their flesh and they were gonna face the consequences. Now we'll see this continue to unfold in the weeks ahead. Um, uh, I haven't said this this one, but I think this is an appropriate moment to do so and I'm moving towards wrapping up, but let me say this. I believe that there is a form of Baal worship that exists today. And it may not be like a golden bull or some idol that people bow down to, but no, there is no question but that in our culture, sex has become a god. Lust has been mainstreamed. Sexual restraint is considered silly and backward and foolish. If a young man or a young woman says, I'm going to save myself for marriage, I'm going to wait until I'm married, to my spouse in the way that God has given us principles to do so than by the world that is seen as backwards and puritanical and, and naive and foolish and a silly way to live. If somebody has the promptings that they want to, a man that wants to be with other men or a woman with other women, then, then there are many in our culture who would say you should give in to those desires because that's where you're going to discover your true identity and live out your true self and experience your truth and then life will be what it was intended to be and then your life will be happier. Increasingly, there are people who would argue that even a, a, um, a young teen whose brain is not yet fully formed, if they are born a female and decide that they want to be a man and they want to have surgery toward that end, then we should approve it, we should go for it, we should encourage it, we should celebrate it. God has made very clear that sex is to be enjoyed within the context of one man, woman, woman, in the context of marriage and in that context and in the way that God described it and when it's in the way that God had intended, then it is, it is God honoring, it is pleasurable, it is wonderful, it is good. But when we, when we choose not to pursue the principles of God, when we, are, when we silence the voice of God, when we instead choose to embrace the voice of the culture, listen, God has spoken, the culture has ignored, the storm is arriving and we see the results. Broken marriages, abortion, abuse, disease, broken families, unfulfilled promises of purpose in life outside of the guardrails of, that God has given us is enslavement and destruction. And friends, that's not just true for, um, for sexual things. That re that's really true in every arena of life. 
that if God has spoken and he has, then to walk and to live in step with his principles is to experience life and life abundant and life the way that God intended. But to ignore that voice and to heed the voice of the culture and to continue is to choose for ourselves the consequences of those choices that will always be destructive, that will always be ensnaring, that will always be enslaving. That's why we must pay attention to the things that matter most. Don't settle for temporal wins. Don't don't let our culture uh, uh, confuse you and draw you in. And as long as the stock market is up, hey, we got every reason to rejoice when spiritually and otherwise it's tanking around us. Know that God is speaking Beware the consequences of ignoring his voice. Lean in to hear what he's saying. That's really, if I, as I conclude, this is really what I'm challenging you to do. Is would you commit today to listen to his voice? To regularly and faithfully shut out the other noises, get along with God, invite God to speak, and in humility, and with an ear that longs to hear what he has to say, listen. In fact, maybe we should pray and ask him to do that now. Would you write where you are? If you're a believer, will you affirm again in your heart, in your mind, in your life, God, you, you, you speak. You're speaking today. I believe he's speaking right now to some of you. Would you affirm that truth in your heart again that he is not some silent father that sits off at a distance and just watches while we crash and burn, but that he cares and that he he warns and that he loves and he instructs and he directs and he encourages. And then would you ask him to give you ears to hear and to listen? If God is speaking and what he has to say is the most important thing for you to know and to lean into and respond to. God, give me faith to believe that you speak. Give me ears and a heart that's open to hear what you're saying. Because I want to follow you. Would you ask him? Maybe you're here today and you've never surrendered to him. Maybe, and I'm telling God has spoken. He spoke in the coming of his son, Jesus. And he's made very clear that to die separated from him without trusting him means to be eternally separated from him. That there is on, apart from Christ on your horizon is an eternal darkness that is difficult to even fully describe or give words to. But God has sent his son, Jesus, that through his sinless life and through his death on our behalf and through his resurrection, through faith in him, that we could be forgiven and we could know God and we could spend forever with him. And the darkness on the horizon is removed and now on the horizon for every believer is the coming of our King Jesus and eternity with him. And so if you've never responded and surrendered to him, you've never heeded his voice and his invitation in that way, then even this morning, right where you're seated, you don't have to make some big show of it. You can right where you are. You can simply say, Lord, today I I hear you. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And Jesus is the only one who can be in that role. And so Jesus here today, now forgive me, save me, lead me as I surrender my heart and my life to you. Come live it through me. I need you. And you'll hear that prayer. Father, thank you that you, um, you speak. You spoke to my heart through our worship today. Thank you for the ways you speak to me through my wife and through my friends and through my, my ministry partners at Woodland Park and others you've placed in my life. Thank you that you speak through your word. Thank you that you speak through circumstances to capture our attention and to draw us to yourself. Thank you 
for the deep inner leading of your Holy Spirit in the lives of those who trust you and know you. God, help us to listen and to hear and to respond in obedience and in surrender again today and tomorrow and every day in front of us until our faith is made sight. We ask it in Jesus' name.